Hey everyone, um, today we've got Connor Cashman from INC here to talk about C++ the evolution of concepts. Um, we're proud to have INC as one of our sponsors as well. Um, they're also sponsoring CrowdJam that, um, that's coming up this Saturday, so make sure that you get a ticket on Eventbrite for contact tracing as well. And um, let's just give a round of applause for Connor for coming here today. Thank you. Awesome. Hey guys, um, just a little bit about me. I'm a UQ alumni as well. I do electrical engineering and math, and now I've been a software engineer at IMC for two years. To give, do, do you guys know what high frequency trading is and stuff like that? Not so much. So basically, to give some insight into why we care about a lot of the things I'll be talking about in this talk, um, IMC is a company that does high frequency trading, so we try and buy and sell things really a lot high frequency, very often, um, and a lot of other people try and do that. And one of the important things in that respect is being able to beat them to opportunities that everyone knows. So everyone knows you can make money if you buy this thing at this time. Who gets there first is the person who gets to buy it. So a lot of what we try and do is optimize for latency, like really low latency, and we're talking in the realm of like under 10 micros, all the way down to some people trying to optimize for picos, depending on what exchanges you're on. Um, the Pico side of things is more of a Josh side of thing, more hardware stuff. You can't get that performant on C++, but um, basically we use a lot of C++ when we need to be really quick, um, but we don't want to have a hardware solution. So I'm going to be talking about C++ in particular, some of the ways we can make C++ really fast. Um, and actually very in particular, I'm going to be talking about templates and how they evolved and how we came up with this idea of concepts. So talk outline. Basically, uh, has anyone here coded in C++ before? A couple, vaguely. It's going to be a, quite a technical talk, so strap in. Um, <laughs> we'll see how we all go. Uh, the introduction to templates is pretty comprehensive-ish, so hopefully you guys can all understand what's going on. And then we'll talk about some more complicated templating concepts, and then the conception of concepts. Sorry, the word concepts is a bit overloaded in this talk. And concepts now. Okay, let's just get into it. Um, we'll start off with a question for the crowd. What do we think this function does? Yeah. No, it is not factorial. <laughs> yeah. Pardon? Does it? Does it? No. So, <laughs> surely guys, come on. <laughs> it's not a factor. You're getting close. But if <laughs> surely guys, surely. You're taking it in, you times it by itself. Yeah. Oh, actually, I've just put a wrong screenshot on it. That's my bad. compile. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered why that would work. Yeah, that's meant to say my other end there, or my end. And then it is, is a power function. So to the power of three will go to the power of two times two. Does that make sense? Uh, that's really awkward that I put that my end there. Originally I had the function in there and I thought, why not ask them what it does? Huge mistake. Okay, uh, imagining that it did work the way it was supposed to. Uh, what do you think the, the runtime of this algorithm would be? Uh, the complexity? What would it be proportional? Yeah, yeah. So it's linear with my other int. Linear in the sense that we just call the same function my other int plus one times. Um, and so as we try to compute the power, it'll take us, as the power gets bigger and bigger, it'll take more and more time. Um, not a particularly hard function, if it worked, but <laughs> uh, not a particularly great way to implement it either, but it, it, it basically works as an own function. What about this function. This is the same function. Well, it'll give you the same answer. Um, what do we think the runtime of this algorithm, runtime complexity of this algorithm is? Same thing? It looks pretty much like the same thing, right? It's the same function, uh, just written with fancier C++ words, right? Um, but actually what the runtime of this algorithm is, is instant. It's 01, it'll just give you the answer straight away. Um, 
and I'll talk about why that is in a second. To understand why, we kind of need to know what templates are. So that template keyword up the top there, template of M and N. Um, a template is a generic implementation of a class, um, a function or a variable, which can be specified by three things. There's non-type template parameters, which are like ints. Uh, usually they're enumerations, integral numbers. Now you can do float point, floating point numbers, pointers, that kind of things. Uh, type template parameters, which is just like a class as a whole. So I could have a function that works on any class or template template parameters, which is like I will supply a template parameter to another template. So that's it just template exception chasing down the rabbit hole. Um, we're going to be talking about the first two primarily for this talk. Um, so that's the only ones you need to worry about. But the important part is that the compiler is the thing that identifies what implementations of a generic class are actually used. So for that template power function, until we say call template power of two to the five, uh, we don't do anything with it at all. And then once we do, the compiler goes and looks at it and it instantiates only what we want and it instantiates the type specific implementations. So what does instantiation mean? Say we look at a very crude implementation of a vector and it's a template, right? So it says template, type name, type up the top. And then it says this vector will have, it'll store types, it has a size and a finish and a front, that kind of stuff. We can add to it, we can take away from it. Um, if I say want a vector of strings, uh, a vector of strings, all I would do is replace the word type with string in these classes. Does that make sense to everyone? So push back, you'd have to put a string in, front would return a string, and my data would be a string pointer. Does that, can people see that? So that's what a template is. It's basically a blueprint for building a class. And until the compiler sees that we want a vector of strings, it, it doesn't build that class. So that means that if I have a program that uses uh, a vector of ints, a vector of strings, and a vector of pointers, then at compile time, I'll generate all three of them. And there'll be three entirely separate classes that don't have anything to do with each other, except that they look the same. So how did we get, how does this end up being, having no time complexity at all, and just being instant? Well, the thing to note is when we do this, we just substitute in what we called it with. So suppose we call template power of 3.5 like this, then the compiler would go through and it would say, put a three where n was, put a five where n was, and figure out what happens. So we'd go down, we say, if const expression five equals zero, const expression just means something that can be evaluated at compile time. So very simple stuff, mainly like integral arithmetic, knowing the types of stuff, uh, that kind of stuff. Then return one. Otherwise, return template power of three, five minus one times by three. Um, and we can also do multiplication at compile time. So then we'd say, hey, we actually need to do template power of three, four now, because five minus one is four. So they go through and instantiate the whole thing again. And then we need to do template of three, three, and again, three, two, and again, three, one, and then we do three, zero, and it would just say, oh, that's one, sweet. And then it would just go back up the stack and return three. So what does that end up meaning? Because all of these things are computed at compile time, like these multiplication down the bottom is computed at compile time as well. If we look at what these look like, why is my swipe not working? At compile time, if we look at my first function for power, this is a, this is a tool called God, Godbolt, by the way. It just shows you what your compiler has done after you compile C++ code. Um, so on the left here, you can see we've got a function and in main we do this. We move around some variables and we call power. It says what power is. Power just does exactly what it says it does. It moves, if it's one, if it's zero, it returns one. Otherwise we call power on something less than it multiply that by that number. But what does it look like in our templated program? It just says return 243. Because all of the, all of the arithmetic was done at compile time. So we've got a function that now computes our powers uh, instantly, which is great. Uh, the, the cost obviously is that you have to compile it all. Um, so if you imagine that you had quite a large, say you want to do three to the power of a thousand, then you'd have to generate them the whole way down and you might run into some issues with your compiler. It might be a bit upset with you, but that's the general idea. Um, so a simple takeaway is that you can gain a lot of runtime speed just by doing things at compile time when you want to. So, what are the constraints on this approach? Uh, 
there's not too many in terms of these non-type ones. So the non-type being the one where it's like an integral or a pointer, um, and we actually specify what it is rather than a class. So when we, when we looked at the vector example, it was uh, parameterized by a class. In this case, it was parameterized by two numbers. And we can actually play around with it a lot. So you can see up here, I've now changed it to say, uh, it returns an auto, which just means, I don't know what it returns. The compiler can decide what it returns, which seems kind of lazy, but it's also really powerful because it means that anyone can reuse this and it will just return the type it's meant to return for them. And we can use like doubles and floats and stuff like that. So the little squiggly underline here is because this has only been introduced in the latest version of C++ and my IDE doesn't have it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you can <coughs> compile these and yeah, the constraints in that you can pretty much do anything in terms of arithmetic just at compile time very simply. Um, but doing arithmetic at compile time isn't particularly that useful because you kind of want to integrate into a large system of things before you can actually do anything meaningful. Um, so let's look at what, how we constrain if we have a, a type. So to give an example that's a little bit close to home for me, if we want to have some class that sends orders and we have a message called order t, um, just a type of order, and we want to be able to make that class as fast as possible. We want to have a specific class for each order type. And inside it, it has a public method which says, send my order, which says, here's the price of the order, here's the volume of the order. Let's set the price, set the volume, send the order off. It goes to the exchange somehow, whatever your send function does. Um, seems pretty easy. Um, what are the constraints and types we can use with this order sender? So if we introduce a couple of types of order, so we can have an int order, so an order where the volume is just specified as an int. Maybe we want to buy five stocks, and you can see that the volume here is an int. We can have a double order, an order where the volume is a double, like 0.0, .0. maybe we're buying, I don't know, a millionth of a Bitcoin or something. I don't know, it's that expensive. I don't know how much Bitcoin's worth, but <laughs> um, you, want, you want to be able to specify double numbers, like 0, .0, 0, 0 0.0, 0.1, that kind of stuff. Um, maybe that will work. And then we have a thing called a market order, right? And the market order is something where you just say, I want to buy this product, I don't care what the price is. Um, so which of these will work with our order sender? Well, if we look at our order sender, it just says, I'll take anything as long as you give me a volume and a price, and then I'm going to call these functions on it. So I'm going to call my myOrder.setPrice, myOrder.setVolume, send. Do people think that it will work for all of the orders? Who thinks it'll work for all of them? Hands up. Who thinks that it, which, which order or orders do you guys think won't work? Market Yeah, why? Because it doesn't have a price. Yeah. So right down here we have set price, and when we try to call send, we get a nice little error that says market order has no member called set price. So what is the constraint on types? The constraint is that the type has to do everything that you say it will do. That's the only constraint. Basically, if, there's, if our function is going to call set price, then you better have a way of calling set price. And it's important to note that this happens at our compile time, which is very useful. So this thing, like this paradigm of programming, is called duck typing. Have you guys heard of that before? Yeah, so if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it can quack too. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's, it's a duck, right? Um, and C++ does it in a way that I don't think too many other languages do it in the sense that it does it statically. So your classes will be able to tell you at compile time if your duck typing is going to break your function as we did before. Um, does anyone want to guess what the benefits are of this? You guys have heard it before. so. Why, what is the benefit of using duck types? Why not just inherit it? If it's a duck, extend from duck. Yeah? I think it just lets you mix and match different things better than inheritance. Yeah, yeah, so you don't need to have a very clear hierarchy. Um, and then, yeah, it's hard for things to be both a duck and something else at the same time, unless you use templates. Um, any other thoughts? We don't mind getting complex. Well, we prefer to not be complex, but we don't mind getting complex if it gives us speed. So it wouldn't be like we wouldn't really rely on templates that much if it was just to reduce complexity. Does anyone, could anyone think of a reason why it would be faster? It's pretty fair. It's kind of hard to figure out why it's faster. <laughs> there's, so there's two, two things that make it faster. One is debatably not that important and the other is quite important. Um, people can't really decide in whether which one is which because it's hard to reason about this stuff. But 
the, the first thing is that if you are extending a class in C++, you have to have virtual function calls. Um, so you have to override functions, and that means that we have to look up those functions somewhere. So we have a thing called a B table, and in the B table you have to follow the pointer to get to what the function actually is. So we store in the B table a list of where the functions are that we want to call, and then we have to look up in the B table that. And that lookup takes time, and we don't like spending time on anything that we don't have to. So if you create a new class for every single class that you want, and it's its own unique separate class, then you don't have to do that. Um, the second thing is, and this is probably more important, by avoiding that B table lookup, it helps the compiler with a thing called de-virtualization, which basically just means it's really easy for the compiler to reason about things. Because it doesn't need to go to another function and figure out what that function does. It just takes exactly what is happening and has a separate function for every single thing. And that lets it do a whole lot of optimizations a whole lot easier. So if you do your coding, uh, if you use templates while you're coding, uh, the compiler is going to be your very best friend until you get compilation errors. And that's going to be your worst nightmare. <laughs> we'll leave that as an exercise for the reader. Um, <laughs> so now that you guys know the basics, you all completely understand templates, right? Is that kind of clear? Do people get what templates are, the idea behind them? We'll start going towards some of the more complex ideas to deal with the templates. Um, a couple of template tricks. So, first things first, actually, I'll go back to our example here. Did you guys notice when we called these functions, we didn't actually specify what template we were using? If you remember, order placer had a send order function and it was templated based on the order, on the volume type, right? It said, I take some misc volume type and then I'll call set volume of that volume type. Um, what, the, what, what we're seeing here is that we don't actually need to specify it if it's kind of obvious what it is, right? So the volume is 15, it's an int. The volume is 12.5, it's a double, and it just goes in and uses those things, yeah? Um, and that's called template argument deduction, and it's very useful. Um, basically, you just it means that your code is a lot cleaner, you don't have all these things everywhere, and it also means that you can get uh, simplifications that you want to happen pretty easily, but you can also run into some nasty bugs. So what do you guys think will come output from this? This little standard out down the bottom. Two point five and two? Yeah. Or three Yeah, two, two. So do people see so so the answer is two point five and two? And the reason is you can see the return type of this template is M which is the second parameter of the function, right? So we can see that the return type of this function will be whatever the second parameter is. In the first case, when we do add 1 and 1.5, the second type is double, so it's 2.5. In the second case, we see that it's an int, so it rounds the int to 2, and there you go. Which is very powerful, but at the same time, very prone to bugs. <laughs> because you can imagine if you had 1.5 and 1 and you added them, or did some function like that, and you ended up returning 2 instead of 2.5, that might cause you to be getting things wrong somewhere down the line. Um, so that's called template argument deduction. It just means that we can deduce what the arguments are and it picks the best fit. Second thing, uh, SFINE. It's called uh, substitution failure is not an error. Um, yeah. This is basically about how we end up deducing what templates to use. So if we look down at our main, let's just, we'll, we'll step through this because this one's kind of complicated. If we look down at our main function, right? We create this object called vowels, and then we say, begin on vowels. Which template should we pick between these two? If we ignore this little weird thing here. If we ignore that decal type thing up the top there, which I'll tell you what that means in a second, it would be ambiguous as to which one we should pick just from the signatures of the functions, right? Because they both just say, hey, take the template of class T and use a reference to it. This, refer this, this thing here just means reference in C++. Yeah? So, I mean, either of these could work and it's unclear which one we should use, um, which, should, which would be an error. But, so, so what we do is we say, we take uh, we, when, when we're looking at these, we find all the things that have the name begin, we look at them and we say, well, what if we substituted in instead of T, we said what the class was. So in this case, it's an int array down here. And we just try and see what would happen if we put T in for all of them, right? We put T into the signature and see what happens. So here, 
in the top one, we would just get int array of C, that seems fine, but then we hit this decal type thing. So decal type is just something that tells you what the type of an object is. You don't need to, it, it, it's never evaluated, it's just like the compiler looks up what this function would return and says, this is what this function would return, the name of the thing that this function would return. And in C++, this is not an object. It, well, it's an object, but it doesn't have a dot .begin function. So this thing wouldn't make any sense because c.begin is not a function. It just doesn't exist. In the same way that we didn't have uh, set price, array does not have begin. So we can see that the, the output, the type that this is meant to return, uh, does not work at all. And therefore, this template is broken, um, which would be bad, except spin a, substitution uh, error, Substitution failure is not an error. So we go, we try to substitute it in, and we say, whoops, it didn't work, this template's totally broken for this case, and we just say, okay, throw this template out, we're not gonna use it anymore. And then we'll just try and use the next one. And we get down to here, and we say, okay, well, if I want the begin, I can just use this one, that one works fine, all of those things are real, and it goes through and follows those. So that's called spin A. Does, does, does that kind of make sense to people? Yeah, substitution failure. So the, just really importantly here, you're substituting into the signatures of the function, right? The things at the top, the return types, the calls. You're not looking inside the function because otherwise we wouldn't have had that error before with set price. So you can't, it has to be only in the, like the declaration of the function. It can't be what we actually do inside the function. So in general, what happens just when we do this, we have a flow of events. Firstly, we say, again, let's look up that name. There's a name, we go and try and find it. And then we say, what are the arguments that are being called here? We did you see argument like the types of the variables being called into the template and then we have a whole set of templates that we could use and then we substitute in the temp the values and see if it makes sense and then we're left with a set of values right and at the end we have to do overload resolution which is like pick the best one um, so here's an example you know how we were talking about duck typing before we have this is called specialization and we say uh, in general, I've got a template that says duck sound of some country and it says quack. But in France, they're a bit crazy and they think the ducks say coin? I don't know, I don't really know. Quack. Quack. Yeah, it sounds kind of like a duck, but not really, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit off that. I had to put this dig in because, uh, yeah, anyway. So what, what happens is when we call duck sound on an object that is a, that is a country, It'll look this is, and it'll say it's just a country, say quack. But if we call uh, duck sound on France, it could use either of these because both of them make total sense. If we substitute in the thing, nothing breaks. It could use either of them. Um, and there's a whole set of rules as to choose which one it is. But the best way to think about it, because we don't have enough time to go into all of them, is to think uh, which one is the most specific. And in this case, we've gone out of our way to specify that ducks in France say quack in a weird way. So it's going to choose that one. And that's called specialization. And it's super useful if you are programming things that need to have edge cases or if there's something that's going to be handled specially. So we could, like, technically we could do market order in a way like this, right? We could say, typically we want you to set the price, set the volume, that kind of thing. Um, but if we have a market order, we just set the volume and then off it goes. Um, and that's one way of approaching this. The problem is that that doesn't scale super well. Um, realistically, we don't want to write a new function every time for every edge case. We just want to be able to write one function that has a clear logic for everything in the same place, and then it's sorted. So, that's where concepts come along. Are we, do we all kind of get all of those things? What did we go over? We went over argument deduction. That makes sense, right? That one's pretty straightforward. Then we went over substitution failure, not an error. So if it, if there's something else it can go to, it's all good. Then we went over specialization, so we can make things handle things in special ways. Finally, yeah, now we can talk about what I actually wanted to talk about from the start. Sweet. So, we're gonna talk about something that is kind of complex. So to make it offset the complexity, it's gonna have a really stupid, simple example. We'll see what you guys think of it. So, we're programming, yeah, there's kind of, rolling with this duck theme, if you guys haven't picked up anything. We're programming the behavior of a number of different type of birds in a computer game. So imagine there's like a computer game happening over here, and then there's some birds that just have to exist in the game and do things. that They aren't really key, they're just in a while loop doing the same behaviors over and over and over again. 
Um, and throughout the day, you want them to do these behaviors, fly, make noises, and hunt. Um, but you want a large variety of birds, right? So everything from ducks to emus, uh, hummingbirds, that kind of thing. Well, those type of birds don't all do the same behavior. So for example, emus don't fly, reef emus and penguins, it's things like that, you know, they, don't, they can't fly. So we want to be able to write a function in our main loop that says fly, make noises, hunt, but if you can't do it, don't do it. Um, which is a deceptively hard problem <laughs> when you are doing C++ and static, uh, static duck typing. Um, and for some reason you decide you want to program this using templates. It's really important that you do it with that uh, to be performant in this. In the, well, maybe these are really expensive operations and you need the compiler to optimize them a little bit. Sweet. So this is our like pseudocode day in the life of bird, right? You, if it, and these functions are what we're going to talk about. Can fly, can sing, can hunt. And it's so easy to write them, but then you see what people had to do to deal with this a long way back. So this is before C++, before 2014, the accepted way of being able to tell if a bird had a, had a function called fly, looks like this. And we're gonna go through each of these. Yeah. <laughs> Can a bird fly? <laughs> yeah. Um, so does anyone, I'll give you guys just a couple of seconds to let it sink in and try and understand it for yourself before we kind of step through each of them. <laughs> it does look a little like gibberish, I won't lie. First time I saw it, it's like, what? <laughs> this was accepted. Uh, this was this occurs in a lot of old code bases before uh, C plus fourteen, and it's still pretty early. And yeah, even even then, but around C plus plus seventeen, they introduced better stuff for doing this, but not great. And then I'm not going to spoil it yet. Okay, <laughs> so what do we think is happening here? Any ideas of what the hell is going on? Uh, we start off right and we just say I've got this class which is a helper class for determining whether or not a bird can fly. Very helpful thing to determine. And it has two functions in it, right? This is all makes sense so far. There's a template, uh, whatever, just some variable, some, some class, right? It's a, it's a type parameter, so it's going to be a class that we put in here. And it's static, so it's going to be known at compile time. Um, it returns a char, and it says I have a function called test and test works on decal type of ampersand c dot colon colon fly, right? So what this means is c colon colon fly is just access, is just the function inside the class c called fly, right? So that what that is talking about is does c have a function called fly? And, and this ampersand is a reference to it. So the decal type of this would be a function pointer. Does that make sense? So a pointer to a function inside a class and the function would be the function that says fly. Underneath it, we have another thing that's also for tests, and it just says, this dot 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 just means I will work on anything. <coughs> Literally, give me a thing, it doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's well formed, like as long as it makes sense at all, um, then it'll be me. So, we come down to where the magic happens down here, and we say we've got this const expression, so something that we know at compile time, it's a boolean, true or false, whether or not the bird can fly, and it is equal to uh, this comparison. Is the size of test t0 equal to the size of char? Which is heinous, because what, like, that has nothing to do with birds flying, right? Come on. <laughs> um, but you've got to note here that this, ch this function test returns char, and this function test returns a long. So these two tests would give you a different size if they ever happened. Right. Um, to make things a little bit more complicated, decal type and size of these things are never actually about evaluated. Right? They're just like the compiler looks up these things and says, "What's the size of this return type on this function?" Right? So what happens is we come in, we call test on the on the on the type name t, and it says zero. Like what? <laughs> this, this is this is the thing that I found most confusing when I started off with it. So what this is this hack is kind of relying upon. This is what people seem to think the only way to do this was in C for many many years was to say that this thing here is a function pointer, and zero will resolve to a function pointer because technically zero could be pointing at a function. I don't know. Um, 
before it resolves to dot dot dot. So it'd be more specific for zero to go into this one than to that one. So because of our template specialization, we would always choose this one if it existed. Now, we've got to remember spin A, which says that substitution error is not a, it, substitution failure is not an error, but it will delete the function and so we can't use it, right? So if C colon colon fly doesn't make any sense because there's no such thing as fly in, in our object C, then this function doesn't exist and we're just going to fall through to test and we're going to get along. So that's the answer, right? So what, what it's doing is saying, if this is well formed, then we'll have a char. If it's not, it's a log. Therefore, if they're the same size, voila, simple, the bird can fly, right? And then we just wrap it in a nice little, nice little value down here, which says you just return the value, this, this value variable down here. Awesome, how good. That is the truly ugly beginning. Here's the new approach, right? So this guy is an absolute G. I would, I would, if you were at all interested in C++, I would watch this talk. It's really, really good. He'll go into a lot, into stuff a lot more detail and a lot more precise than what I'm doing here. And he won't even talk about words. So. I mean, <laughs> plus or minus depends, depends what you think. But yeah, if you're interested, I would definitely recommend watching this talk. Um, but he kind of had a rev that talk was like a big moment in CPP con history. See, so like a lot of people watched that talk and a lot of it changed the way people code. C++, particularly around this area. Um, and he introduced a new approach. Still, to be honest, not that lovely, <laughs> right? <laughs> but more lovely because for, for a couple of reasons. So the first, so we look at this, right? And we say, why? Why is this thing here? It just doesn't make any sense. It's just a random template that says void t equals void and it will work for any single class that, great, great. That doesn't help us very much at all. Um, but it doesn't particularly, it, we'll understand why later. So first we specify the default template, which is to say, birds can't fly. The second template says, if a bird can fly, and we do the similar trick here with this decal type T, then we return true try. So what does this evaluate to if this is well formed? Decal type T and fly. It also evaluates to template with class T void. So we end up getting exactly the same thing twice. And then once again, because this one's more specific, right? It says you've gone all to all the effort to say this is what we should do if it's a French duck, or this is what we should do if the bird can fly. Um, it's a true type, right? And then we can create our function, can bird fly, voila, we just take the value out. So a little bit better, and this, this void t thing actually ended up being introduced into C++ like this. You just put standard void t, and that's like the way that it was going on for a long time now. Um, but this talk kind of changed the way everyone could do it because you can put anything in here and it'll make sense. So you can also describe whether an object is movable or copyable. Uh, you can do tons of reasoning about the object and just slap it in here, void t is that, and then you're good. Um, which is pretty cool. Uh, this guy really, uh, I think the, the funniest thing about the talk you watch is watching the people in the crowd being like, oh my God, dude, the whole time is talking because it kind of blew their minds a little bit. Um, but yeah, the, when once this happened, this was kind of the norm. This would go around and be used a lot. So we would end up having a function that looks like this. Day in the life of the birds, compiled, it says, if, now we've got these const uh, expressions there, and it says, if can fly the bird, bird fly. If can sing, sing, yada, yada, yada. But what's important, right, is that for each bird that we put in, uh, say it's a duck, it can fly, sing, and hunt, do ducks hunt? I don't know. Um, <laughs> if we put it in, and these const expressions are true, then we'll actually compile them out and we'll just use the ones that we want to use. And this is really important. So you could say back, all the way back when we were doing the market order thing, you could just say, uh, have a function inside market order that says uh, uses price. And if uses price, then set price. Otherwise, don't set price all the, in, our, in our order center. But that introduces a branch, right? It says, hey, in our core logic, Maybe we'll do one thing, maybe we'll do the other thing when we're about to send an order. Um, what we want is for the function itself to have no branches. And this once again comes back to the compiler, right? The compiler can very easily reason, very easily reason about your code if there's no if statements in it, uh, because then it doesn't have to think about what's gonna happen this way and what's gonna happen that way. And that's what these if context for things do, right? 
So if I'm an emu, this function will not come in and say, uh, if I can fly, fly. If I can sing, sing. If I can hunt, hunt. It will just say hunt. And if I'm a duck, it'll say, fly, sing, hunt. Um, and that's kind of the power of these things. So you save a lot. Of, you can see why that would be really important um, in our use case, not particularly in the, in the creating a game about birds use case. Um, so it was a really important tool, and people kind of used that functionality that he showed everyone to make a lot of code that looks like this. And it's pretty ugly <laughs> when you see it. So what happened next? Basically, once that happened, a lot of people started relying on these techniques more and more and more, and then within the language, people were like, can we please stop writing these bizarre template things that no one can understand? And we ended up having something that looks like this, and this is in, uh, did I put this the wrong way around? Or did I just not take a screenshot? Woo. I deleted it, I deleted the slide. You hate to see that, give me one second. Control Z, was that undeleted? Oh, the timing on that. Um, now you can see it in the IDE, even better. <laughs> Don't read that. <laughs> Where are we? Here we go. This is the slide that I accidentally deleted. And I'm good. We have a thing called concepts, and it is just a very nice syntactic sugar around what we saw just before. So we have a concept that flies that says, if you if you fly, uh, you require that if I have some class T, A, I can call A dot fly. Pretty simple, very well, very readable. A uh, concept called hunts, same thing. You can even specify. Um, what the output is, so this down here says a.sings returns something that I can convert to a string if you wanted to try and write down the sound of a bird singing, I don't know <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, and so so you can see that this becomes it is essentially just what we did before, right? but it's so much easier to reason about and to write um, which is great, and then you can have what I was just showing you then all of these nasty functions just become if I can fly, if can fly, the default's false, but if it is something that implements flies, then it's true. Uh, I just put them out of order. Anyway, that's about, um, but it's also much more accessible, right? Because if someone, if you looked in the code base and saw some of that stuff that I was putting up on the board, you'd just be like, what the hell's going on here, right? Um, but I think more importantly, the thing that I really like about C++ is that some guy can be like, hey, I was trying to do this thing and I couldn't do it and then I found a way to trick the compiler into doing it because the, the language is really powerful and it can grow from that into being a language feature that we learn today and pretty much everyone in the whole world who uses C++ will use. And I think that's something that's really exciting about C++ as it's evolving all the time. There's things like Boost, which is just like a library of different algorithms that people think are useful and then all, like a large amount of them just get merged into C++. Hey, this is going to be part of the standard now. And I think that's super exciting. So being able to work on the, like the cutting edge of this stuff allows you to have not just like influence how you code or how your workplace codes, but like how people code all over the world, um, which is really, really cool. Um, that was kind of my big takeaway for this talk. Hopefully the template stuff wasn't too crazy, but Hopefully you have some incentive to have a look at C++ because not enough people do and it's really, really cool. Anyway, now on to my HR piece. My <laughs> piece about spooking IMC to you guys. First of all, if you found that kind of stuff interesting or you thought that that would be, that, that, that like any of that was cool, then you probably should be interested in IMC. I had like never used templates before, before I started C++, before I started IMC pretty much. So. You learn a lot while you're working there is probably the first thing that I would say. Um, the other stuff though, uh, IMC does do like a lot for charity. We have like a global giving program where we give away tons of money. We have a dedicated like fund where we decide who to give money for. We have uh, a couple of events which are really cool around that like uh, trading for Tanzania. So we do a day of the year where we just donate all the money that we make to uh, Room to Read. 
in Tanzania, which is about improving literacy in Tanzania, but we also have local givings that each office uh, gives to charities inside their country. Yeah, last year we actually did a pretty cool thing. You know the push-up challenge, we did that, but then every week after we used to do like morning exercise where one person would lead it, and then based on the amount of participation, they would get to give away money to charity. Um, so we gave, we'd give away like $5,000, $10,000 each week to a charity of your choice, which is really cool if you want to be able to have yeah, this last little piece here about employee involvement, right? If there's a charity that matters to you, then it's really easy for you to make a difference for them just by making IMC give them money. Uh, we also, yeah, it's pretty much, it's pretty much how it works. Uh, yeah, it, it, even if you refer someone and they get employed, then you get one part of your reward is that you get to give $10,000 to a charity of your choice. So it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty integral to how IMC works, which is pretty cool. I really like that about us. Um, Here's some example of the the charities that we uh, sponsor. These are like kind of the big ones, the ones that we put a lot of money into. It's not the individual ones. Um, feel free to just ask you about any of them afterwards. Um, other than that, we have pretty good time. <laughs> That's kind of clear. Basically, we do a lot of a lot of events throughout the year. Yeah, COVID kind of shut that down a little bit last year. We'll try to, but we still did a lot of things. Um, we like you go out to team dinners all the time. We have special days in the office, like superhero day, where we're just up as superheroes. One of the key things we have is the weekend away, which is one weekend in the year where the whole company goes away on a holiday together, and they have like all these planned activities for you guys, and it's it's pretty sick. It's pretty awesome. This year we couldn't do it because of COVID, obviously. So they just said he will sponsor each of you to go on a holiday by yourself. Pretty nice as well. Um, <laughs> not gonna lie. Pretty good, uh, but yeah, we generally it's like a super fun place to work. It's not like finance is a pretty bad rep for being terrible work life balance. It's not, that's not a, at all what we're like, to be honest. Um, it's kind of ludicrous how much, <laughs> how, <laughs> how much work life balance we really get. And then, uh, this is just some pictures of our office. We're back in the office, we've got the open bar on Friday nights. Everyone's come back now, but you're free to work from home flexibly. Um, like we're working from up here while we're doing these events and yeah, I don't really know what they want me to say about the office other than like here it is, it's nice. <laughs> you should uh, all apply and you can come down and see it. Uh, our internship, yeah, uh, I'll just do a quick explainer about internship because our internship is actually really cool. So the internship at IMC, we will take you down to Sydney for 10 weeks. Two weeks we'll be back home over Christmas, but uh, 10 weeks in total we'll put you up and you'll stay with the other interns in a hotel and then you'll come in every day and you'll have a project that we want you to complete in the eight weeks. You'll get to do like a whole bunch of fun stuff. We do like pizza trading and all this other stuff. But at the end of the day, after the eight weeks, you have a project that we will merge straight into our existing code base and use it all the time. So it's kind of an opportunity to see the level of contribution that you'll get to have straight away. Um, IMC is all about being able to contribute quickly and putting a lot of trust in people. So even if you're just down for eight weeks as an intern, we will see what you create and use it and make money off it and have a good time. So these are our current opportunities. We have got, yeah, you guys can read them. We, yeah, feel free to ask any questions about anything in the talk or anything like that. How many monitors do you have at your desk? Me, I, I'm, I only have two monitors. I think it's, you don't need it. <laughs> Maybe if you're a trader, but <laughs> as a software engineer, I don't think that I, you really need to look at too many things at the same time. It's not going to help you, at least for me anyway. Yeah. Um, does C++ have anything like interfaces? Uh, like interfaces in Java? Yeah. Um, no, like, like yes, you can have like pure abstract class. So like, like you can have classes that have functions and just make them virtual and override them. Um, but yeah, yeah, like it does, but we don't really use it very much. Yeah. So, like, could you do something? Yeah, but you would you would lose the benefits of determining all these things at run uh, at compile time. So, if you have a if you say I've got something that implements an interface, you do that vtable lookup that we were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. As a software engineer, how much do you have to know about like? market side of things? Um, not too much, to be honest. It depends where you work. So I work in execution, so low latency stuff, which is about 
making messages appear faster, which is a, quite a bit removed from deciding what the price of a thing will be. Um, everyone's expected to have like a kind of interest in it, um, but coming into it, I had no idea about any of that type of stuff. Yeah. So as a graduate there, the, like, the start of your time there is a training program, the first bunch of which is learning about the market. So yeah. there's no pre-shift knowledge coming into the company that we teach you everything you need to know. Yeah. You're all about markets. Yeah. What's your favorite part about working at RMC? Um, I think the, so it's the fact that when you have an edge in the in these markets and everyone everyone's trying to do the same thing right when you get an edge you can't just like sit back and be done like because everyone's trying to figure out what you're doing you're trying to figure out what they're doing and trying to figure out how to make it faster and faster which means that you need to keep problem solving as like there's no time to just like chill out basically um there's always something new to solve and something new to do particularly when everyone's trying to do a, like a similar thing it also means that you get to be quite creative with your problem solving and stuff like that. The other thing that I really like is that there's a ton of really smart people who work there who get to teach you a lot of stuff, like through code review and just through talking with them all. Hey. Uh, one of the things I was curious about the template was, um, you said that all, all that stuff can be figured out at compiled line and the compiler will just generate all that code for you, mm -hmm. so that it's like a lot faster. Mm -hmm. But then, isn't that if you know what your input is and if you know like whether it's like the yeah. code down, yeah, so you need to know what your input is at the start, but that doesn't, so you won't have a class which is templated based on like a input string, right? Yeah, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want it to be, I know I received some event from the market and I've got a class that will t exactly process these bytes and then do that. Um, typically it would be something like, I have all these orders, uh, all these exchanges that we trade off, right? And maybe we have I don't even know how many protocols, like a lot of protocols, like 20, 30 protocols of the exchange that we need to send. But the logic is still vaguely the same. It's like, see opportunity, send order. Like, do see opportunity, convert opportunity into what we should send, send order, right? And we want that workflow to be as quick as possible, yeah? So we want to make a template which says, uh, like actually kind of similar to what I had, which is like, see the opportunity, convert it into a price, set price, set volume, right? And we want to do it without having to have a virtual lookup or anything like that. So we want to, we would template the message and say, cool, I can call these functions on my message. And then we just say, this is a program designed for running with this templated type of message. Yeah, it's, yeah. You, you do need to know everything at part time, you're right. <laughs> so there's limitations to it, but you can, you can get a lot. Hey. A quick question from the chat. Um, donations aside, how else does IMC give back to society for all of the resources invested? Like, do you guys contribute to open source? Or? Uh, we don't have to. We don't really contribute to open source very much. Um, we do use some open source code, and at that point, we contribute to open source basically. Um, yeah, we also have time dedicated in the year for people to take off to go and volunteer at charity and stuff like that. Um, yeah, we, we, run, we run events for people, like we, we do coding camps for people, that kind of stuff. We go, visit, go out and visit schools and do stuff like that. So it's not just like we make some money, we cut some off the top and give it to someone without really caring. It's we strongly involve, like believe in getting involved in the charitable side of things and giving yourself, not just giving your time, not just the money. Hey. Would you say having a background? Realistically, probably, yeah. Um, just because C++ developers are a much rarer quantity than a Java developer um, or a whatever else developer. Um, program experience is quite hard hiring people in C++. So if you want to give yourself an edge, <laughs> then it's a good thing to learn. I, yeah, it's also just interesting, but yeah. You, you would have a better chance if you, but, but I didn't know anything about C++. Well, I vaguely knew about C++ when I applied for the job, but I, I didn't have a background in C++. My background was in electrical engineering, anti-C, like firmware C. So no object orientation or anything like that back when I did it. <laughs> and the people that work there, typically work there for a long time? Um, 
kind of depends. There's not there's not like a super high turnover rate, um, and often the ter like people who change will change into companies. So the industry seems pretty good. Um, I we have a lot of people who've been around for a long while. Is what I'd say. So it's mainly like people who've been there for ages, and then a whole bunch of new people at the moment because we're growing so. Awesome. Well, thanks very much, guys. Hope you learned something. <laughs> Thank you.